Our message this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah, chapter 9, verse 1 through 7. But there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is God's word. Thank you for coming out on this frigid day to be warmed by the gospel of Jesus. We uh, turn our attention immediately before we pray to the text, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. The prophet Isaiah prophesied between the years somewhere around 740 to 700 BC. This is a time wherein God called this man, Isaiah, who was probably um, an aristocrat. He had access to man of God, yet was of uh, high stature. He had access to kings. He could wander in and, and address kings. I couldn't do that. All of us couldn't. We couldn't get an audience with the president president, even if we tried. Um, But this guy had a very unique relationship with the kings, and um, many scholars believe he was of the aristocratic crowd. His message was directed to Judah and to Jerusalem. He spoke about God's sovereign grace in salvation. He issued many warnings to the people of God and to the nations. He spoke of the new creation to come and the coming of the Messiah as a child in Isaiah 7, verses 11 through 14. And then in our passage, the same child who would be king appears. In chapter 8, you see the uh, challenge from Isaiah to the people of God visible. He challenges them because they have turned away from God and gone after the occult. Look, if you will, at chapter 8 and uh, beginning at verse 19. And when they say to you, inquire of the mediums and the necromancers and chirp and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Should they inquire of the dead on behalf of the living? So they had turned away from the living God and had gone after things that would be considered of the occult. 
Furthermore, the Assyrian invasions, uh, led by a uh, man you may call Tiglath Pileser or Pileser, some say, or you can just say T. Pi. This guy invaded uh, <coughs> the lands held by the people of God and was the hand of judgment upon them, sent by God himself. And look at the verse down in verse 22, and they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. This is, the, this is the language of judgment upon the visible people of God. And then all of a sudden, chapter 9, verses 1 through 7, explodes on the scene. And last week, Pastor Joe preached out of the book of Ephesians, and he talked about the, the sudden explosion in the language of Paul, exalting God. Well, you see that here. And there's something about Old Testament prophecy that we need to understand. This is poetry and prophecy, Old Testament poetry, and it is delightful to read in the original language. It's delightful to read in our language as well, and in any language, but at this core language you see the, on the page, you see the joy of Isaiah. Prophecy works like this. If you were standing, let's say, in Denver and you were looking at the mountains, the Rockies, and you were able to draw a beautiful square on the Rockies. And you look at those mountains, and you see them, and they all look as though they're on the same plane. Then you are able to, with a giant laser, cut out that uh, reality, that square, and pull it toward you. You would see a front piece and a side piece, a great big rectangle. So that if you went over and looked, you would see, oh, there are spaces between the mountains. And let's say you had a unique helicopter and you were able to fly up over the top on the, on the top face of this great uh, piece that you pulled out of the mountain. And you would see that there are lush valleys. You have three dimensions that you are gazing at. In prophecy, language is used and when you read it, it looks like everything is up close, but when you get around the side, when the prophet shows you a little bit of the side, you see that there's distance between events. And then you fly up on top, and you will see that the lush valleys of grace and the details, the future things are laid out, although obscured by cloud. And this is one way of looking at Old Testament poetry and prophecy. The language is squeezed together, many events happening at once, and they look as though they're happening all at the same time. And then you have to go to the side, and we will see, and then the top. And we're going to see this kind of language followed upon us today as we walk through the text. This is an amazing passage, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. In verse 2, you will see language unusual. Past tenses are used to describe things that are going to happen in the future. Why? Because they are so certain in that they will happen that they are already in the past, in the eyes of God and through his Holy Spirit through his holy word by way of the prophet. And then we will see the coming of the Messiah as child in this passage. And from this text, we're about to be blessed from the pen of Isaiah. This man who wrote 740 BC, he wrote this passage under the influence of the Holy Spirit way back then. He was talking about events that were happening at the time judgment events, and then he's going to bring three words to the people of God then, to the people of God in the New Testament era, and the people of God today. This is how we look at the text, you look at it up front, you say, wow, there's a lot there. Then you go around to the side, oh yeah, oh I see, there's time between this event and this event and this event, and that points to eternity, and you get up on top and you say, man, Look at the gracious and wonderful provisions of God. Are they not lush? Aren't those valleys deep? It's a 
kind of language we're going to look at today. The three words we're going to examine are hope, joy, and grace. They're stuck in this passage and we want to bring them out. So let's pray to that end. Heavenly Father, extend our joy at Christmas through this passage that was written long before the Bethlehem event. Extend our joy, reduce our arrogance, reduce our delight in ourselves, and let us look to God who sent his Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer, to die, to rise. By the power of the Holy Spirit, might we look intently at these truths this week, and may our lives be more Christ-focused than self-focused. We pray these things in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I was just a little bit missing uh, this week. I was talking to one of my sisters, and uh, we were talking about uh, growing up on the East Coast, and uh, I love the smell of the ocean, and I was looking on the internet at pictures of sunrises uh, in Nova Scotia. And sunrises are beautiful everywhere you are, but I remember sunrises in Nova Scotia, you just couldn't help but go by the ocean and watch as uh, pitch black, can't see anything. You can hear the ocean, but you can't see much of anything. Assume uh, just a morning, just before the sunrise, and all of a sudden you see this crack of light. And it streams across the water, and then you see the shore as the sun progresses on its course that celestial sphere and then you see the shoreline coming into view and then you see what is on the shore you see houses and trees and all sorts of wonderful things and then it's sun up and your face is full of the light consider that scene Maybe a scene of sunrises that you, uh, of a sunrise that you have seen recently, the progression, the crack of light, seeing the shoreline, and then the full view of what is upon the shore. Think of that progression as you walk through this text with me, because we're going to be looking at these, this, this delight. The people of God needed to hear this. The remnant of the people of God needed to hear this because there was much gloom around them and God in his grace used the, used the prophet Isaiah to bring this truth to them and so do we need it today. We're going to see a progression from gloom to brilliance by way of three words. And if we will, by the grace of God, this week embrace these words, consider them, our greatness will shrink and the wonder of God will increase. The whole essence of reformation and revival is that we get small and God gets big. Immense, in fact. We will embrace these words and truly get them. Our celebration of Christmas will be enhanced. Our fears and struggles will be reduced. And Christ will be exalted. So let's take a look at these three words. We're going to march through the text. Follow with me. Chapter 9, 1 through 7 of Isaiah. We will make contact with the New Testament. And we will consider applications now and into the future. Here is what Isaiah wrote, approximately 740 BC. Look at verses 1 and 2. 
In chapter 8, verse 22, we end with this. They will look to the earth, but behold, distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness, as is said to the visible people of God. Those who claim to follow Yahweh, but in this case, they're not. Their hearts aren't right. But, chapter 9, verse 1, there will be no gloom for her. Who was in anguish in the former time? He brought into contempt the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. What does this mean? Well, the land of uh, these are the lands that uh, were affected greatly by the invasion of the Assyrian king Tepi, Tiglath, Tiglath Pileser the third. I'm a little leery about people who use that. I am so-and-so the third. <clears throat> so they may have been leery of this guy. The Assyrian king, he took over in 745 BC in Assyria. What he did was he said, well, I don't like that royal family, so he killed them all, as most uh, usurpers did in those days. They killed the he killed the royal family, took over the throne in Assyria, and became known as one of the greatest generals in the history of the world. He, he just took the army, and like Napoleon, he made it into a fighting force that he could uh, move with just as a, at the, the wave of his hand and took most of the known world in his day. He looked to the area of uh, Israel and decided he wanted that too. And God used him to judge his people, and he sent Tiglath-Pileser, and he did the bidding of God, although T. Pi certainly was not a believer. So, this is the reference, Zebulun and Naphtali. But in the latter time, note this, all of a sudden, the dimension changes. The picture changes in the latter time. What? This is now going from the context of Isaiah to a time, future, way future. And he has made glorious the way of the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. If you combine this language, particularly Galilee of the nations with latter time, you end up at Matthew 4, 15 through 16. Turn there, if you will, Matthew 4, 15 through 16. Now, why are we looking here? Because of this. If you will note, Matthew 4, this is the word of God. Little context, verse 12. Now, when he heard that John had been arrested, he withdrew into Galilee, and leaving Nazareth, <clears throat> he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea upon the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, a people dwelling in darkness, have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region in the shadow of death, on them a light has dawned. From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom is at hand. So, Isaiah is used of God uh, to present the word of God, which has, which has significance immediately for the people of God and in the future. The Bible goes on in verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them has light Dawned. We just quote that was just quoted in Matthew chapter 4. What is the essence here? What is he driving at? Isaiah is, is calling our attention, calling the first hearers and readers in the Old Testament, and calling us in the modern era to look. Latter time, Galilee of the nations points. They point to the ministry of Jesus Christ. They point 
to the glorious ministry of Jesus Christ. They point our attention to him today. The words of Isaiah point us to Matthew 4, and they point us to the days when Christ will come again. The eyes of the people of the, of the God, the eyes of the people of God in the Old Testament were directed. They were directed toward Galilee and the ministry of the Messiah. Hadn't happened yet. Hadn't happened yet. But God took them there. In the first context, the people, the people of God were given hope, and so are we. In the midst of gloom and doom, the people were shown that God cares for the remnant. He cares for the people who trust in him. The people who walked in darkness have seen, a, have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness on them has light shined. It is so certain that it will happen that the author uses the past tense in the Hebrew language in verse 2. Why does he do that? It's so certain it will not fail. The plan of God will not fail. Hope is on the way. The context original was this, the people of God visible, that's the believing and the unbelieving together in a group of people called the Israelites. Those people were in great gloom. What God wanted them to know through his prophet was that hope was on the way. Now, although we're not in the midst of gloom brought on by an invasion of a foreign, by a foreign power, we do face serious challenges, even brought on by our own sin. It can bring us to a sense of hopelessness, darkness, and loneliness. Some of us battle boats of depression, others pain of bad memories, others an overwhelming sense of failure. And so we need to compensate by elevating ourselves and thinking highly of ourselves when really at the core we recognize that something is wrong. Although we be believers, we have a serious problem going on. We are hopeless. So then by the Holy Spirit, seek to replace these things with trust in the gift of the promised Spirit of God. That too is prophesied by Isaiah. That too is prophesied by the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, this is no happenstance. This is in the plan of God. Romans chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. The Bible says this. And this is, this is such a very gentle passage. Romans chapter 5, we'll go to 1. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith and a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, that's the foundational statement, Paul writes, through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And what is hope? It's trusting in the promises of God yet not received finally. He declares, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance, endurance character, Character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The prophecy of Isaiah to the people of God in gloom is designed by the Holy Spirit to encourage them, to give them hope. What is coming is amazing. And in a moment, we're going to see it explode upon the page. We have now just touched on hope. Picture the sunrise. A big flash of light across the horizon has come, which points to Matthew 4, which points to the lifting of darkness by light eternal, which points the people of God in the direction of hope. Hope in God, hope in Christ. The second word is joy. Look at verses 3 through 5. 
This is very important. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoiced, they rejoiced before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. This is the picture of the people of God who have just been given hope. Now they are shown that joy will be theirs. Joy. This mood is intense in the language original. The word multiplied, the word increased, these verbs, they speak of joy in a worshipful sense. Further, it is described using harvest and victory words, as you see in, in verse 3. This joy is the kind of joy that people had when they brought in the harvest and were able to eat and enjoy one another and thank God. It's that kind of joy. Then listen to this, verse 4. For the yoke of his burden, the staff for his shoulder, and the rod of his oppressor you have broken as on the day of Midian. This is a picture of God lifting the burden from his people. They're under great gloom, under heaviness. And think of the people worldwide today who are under persecution, the, the people of God. And yet they have hope. And yet they have joy because they know that in the days to come, God will lift the burden. In these days, in the language here, the language to the first hearers and readers, Isaiah is saying, God is the one who will lift your burden just as he did in the days of Exodus, just as he did uh, in the days of Gideon in chapter 7 of the book of Judges, when over 30,000 men were turned away and uh, over 30,000 men were reduced to 300 men so that Gideon could fight a battle and win it by the power of God. Now the light is intensifying. A small remnant will participate in this day of great joy. Verse 5 says, For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. So the oppressing army will be crushed ultimately by God. In the immediate sense and in the final sense. The oppressor will be put down. The destruction of the hostile forces will be taken care of by God. These promises given to the people of God are sufficient to raise the joy level. Think now of the sunrise, brilliantly shining on the shoreline. Think of it. Now you can see the waves. And the people of God are beginning to melt. Oh yes, gloom is freezing. It's, it seems as though your whole system shuts down when everything's gloomy. But when the light comes, things change. And so great joy is going to be their portion. God is going to bring freedom from oppression to his people who will experience great joy. These are the words that are in the context of this messianic passage. And guess what? We find similar language in Luke 2. So if we turn to Luke chapter 2. Luke 2. What we're really doing here is we're building... A, if you like, a theology of worship rooted in word and prayer. If we do not know God, and not increasing in our knowledge of God, then it doesn't matter what we do, we will not worship God. What Isaiah is doing is he's giving to the people of God a picture of who God is. Know him. That's who he is. He's the provider of hope. 
He's the provider of joy to the people of God. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 14. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. Who were these shepherds? They were non-entities in the first century. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is well pleased. Wow. The joy of the moment when these shepherds looked into heaven was immense. And that prophecy that was indicated in Isaiah finds part of its fulfillment right here. As you look to the side of that great piece that we've drawn out of the Rockies, you look and you say, oh my, Isaiah was talking about to the, the people here in 740 B.C., but it has impact in the first century. And not only that, but it has impact in 2016 on a frigid day in a wee little town called Kwamba. Wow. Where is Kwamba anyway? God knows. This kind of joy is still present and is proper for the people of God. Consider this, therefore, brothers and sisters. Perhaps some of our lives are joyless right now. Just joyless. And you can tell. There's people sense it when they're around you. Just joyless. They sense the lack of the joy of the Lord. What they sense is judgment. What they sense is an arrogance and the stench of pride. If there is no joy, then other things move in. But take heart, because God is great. Here's this task. Take time to pray that God might restore, restore our joy and push out the things that lift up dark things and glue. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say, rejoice, rejoice, says Paul. It's a command. Take time by the Holy Spirit to pray, God, restore my joy. Restore my joy in the celebration of Christmas. Rejo restore my joy in Christ. Restore my joy in the Word of God. In prayer, restore my joy in you, O oh God, above all else. Restore my joy. Murray McShane once said to gathered believers, Look at your troubles but once, often sponsored by one sin, but look to Christ six times. Therein, is this pattern for joy. Look to Christ. Look to Him for grace and mercy. Look to Him for a hope. And our joy will increase. The people of God in the first century, and they needed to hear it. The people of God in 740 B.C. needed to hear it, and we need to hear it today. You can see our mountain on the side. Wow, here we are. Isaiah's there. New Testament are right there. Boy, what he said certainly unraveled to the glory of God in a wonderful way. Look at the distance between the mountains. And look at the mountain upon which we stand right now. We stand in a joyful place, in a hopeful place. To the glory of Christ. 
Last word is grace. Look at verses 6 and 7. All of a sudden, now, with hope, we see the, the line of light at the horizon. And now with joy, we see the shoreline. And now, with the word grace, we see the landscape lights up. All the greenery. We see people wandering about. Now we can see the fish jump. Verse 6, 4, here's the cause of all the previous wonder. For to us, people of God, a child is born, reminiscent of chapter 7, verse 11. Ask a sign of the Lord your God, let it be deep as Sheol, as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, I will not push the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O hosts of David. Is it too little for you to weary men? And you weary my God also. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God with us. That passage delightfully flows into this one. Unto us a son is given. Why do we use the word grace here? Because the Hebrew word Natan means a sovereign, gracious gift of God. That's why. For unto us a son is given, a Natan son. The right time, here he comes. And the government, that is the rule of the dominion, shall be upon his shoulder that which bears a burden. And so you see that this son is going to rule and he's going to rule with great power. His shoulder can sustain it and his name shall be called and there are four names here and we'll go through them. And we'll go through them a little quicker than we thought we might do. The child will have immense power and authority and here are his names. Wonderful Counselor. Wonderful has overtones of deity. Counselor in the Hebrew word means that he doesn't need to receive counsel. He gives it to his people. And then it says, mighty God. Yes, he gives the counsel. He instructs them for their good. And he's also El Gibur. He is God and man in one person. Notice that, the doctrine of the Incarnation as old as Isaiah. Not in full flower yet, because we need the New Testament for that. But here you see it. Mighty God, everlasting Father. He's tender, faithful, wise, teacher of his people, guardian, provider for all eternity. That's what wonderful Father says of this great ruler. And then Prince of Peace. The Messiah embodies peace. And the Word says, this little word, this Hebrew word, he's going to remove all the peace-disturbing nonsense that the world throws at us. Those are his names. Those are the names of Christ in the Old Testament word here given by God to Isaiah to the people of God. And these words are designed to, to cause us to celebrate hope, joy, and now grace. We look at the mountains in side view. We say it's incredible. Now fly up, fly up, and look at that, that third window in this, this very large volumetric uh, <clears throat> rectangle. You look down now at the lush fields of grace. And now you're going to see the depths of the valleys. Look, as full light comes up, look. Of the increase of his government and of peace, secession uh, in terms of war, there'll be no more war, but also peace, the shalom, that peace in God, in Christ. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there shall be no end. There's a picture here of the Davidic throne coming up right now. 
and you see the word increase and government and no end, whoever this is, he's the Messiah. What is he going to do? He will rule on the throne of David, infinitely greater than David's throne. Oh, and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it. Here come the pillars out. Two pillars of this kingdom. And what are they? Justice and righteousness. Oh, my. This king will be just. He will always do what is right. And righteously, his righteousness, his, his, his golden heart, if you like, will rule. He is truly, truly righteous exercising truth flawlessly and as we look at our side view again you see that this righteousness this righteousness becomes a part of the people of God who have true faith in Christ Jesus we see that in the New Testament in full dawn from this time forth and forevermore, that's eternal. On the top view now, you see how deep these valleys of grace are. This is eternal truth for the people of God. We will be ruled by a king. He's not a boy king. He starts out as a child. And he becomes mighty God, El Gibur. And he holds up the kingdom. And he has two pillars. There's a pillar of justice and the pillar of righteousness. He will always do what is right. And he will, he will follow the truth. He is truth. And he commends this truth to his people. So that they might live righteously. Our ruler king, our judge, who will always do what is right. He will always do the truth. That is the gracious provision of God for his people. Luke 1, 30 through 33. Note this before we close. We'll have some brief comments and then we'll close. Luke chapter 1. Note this. Now you're looking down into the deep valleys. Now you've gone from the front to the side. We're up on the top. We're looking down at the deep valleys full light of dawn is upon us, although yet we see not perfectly. Here is what the Bible says. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary. We're going to pick up at verse 30. This is the message from God. And the angel said to her, who is Mary? Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. This is the gracious gift. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. This is the language extended. First people to hear it, 740 B.C., New Testament fulfillment, beginning. In Christ Jesus, born, becoming the King of kings and Lord of lords uh, in terms of his teaching and preaching before the people of God. They see who he is. They see, they see increasingly, this is the very Son of God, begotten, not created. That's, that's the King of kings. And they, then they turn on him and then... There is the cross, and then there is the resurrection, and then the Holy Spirit is sent, and then the church sees. Goodness, this is the King of kings and Lord of lords, as promised by Isaiah, and as demonstrated in the birth of Christ, and declared by the angel. Now we see him full flower, and we will see him in increasing measure in the days to come in the final form we'll see him God the grace of God was displayed to the first audience to those at the time of the birth of Christ and to us today 
the wonders were displayed before us. We are graced in that we're under Christ's rule. We are united to deity. We are the receivers of his counsel. We're the people of peace. How many of these delights are we actually experiencing these days? Which one is most assaulted? Pray that God might show us what must go and must, must be put on by the Spirit in order to delight in his gracious provisions now and in eternity. You will see so many wonderful things this Christmas as you look into the word, as you pray, as you embrace these words from the pen of Isaiah, hope, joy, and grace. Consider them. And there's one more thing. Just as Christ, who was King of kings and Lord of lords at his birth, lived a life before humans, taught them, preached, showed great signs and wonders, it began to dawn on them more and more who this guy really is by the Holy Spirit. And some of them, like Simon Peter, had unique experiences attached to this dawning. And we can, even though we're clouded by day-to-day -day experiences, by word and prayer, can see the wonder of Christ increase in our hearts. He is who he is, God and man at the same time without division. But our world clogs that view. Our world clouds our view. Our world wants us not to see the dawn. May our love for Christ increase. May we see him more and more as peoples in the first century saw him more and more. And we must see him more and more in his wonder until the day of Christ dawns fully. Reread the passage and especially look at chapter 7 verse the last part of verse 7, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. His ardor, his enthusiastic dedication will do this for his people. He's going to do this. Know that the truths will not fail. They will not fail because Christ is coming again to gather his people to himself. Let the celebration continue. That is all. Those are the words. Their hope, their joy, and their grace. Old Testament, New Testament, modern era. They point us to Christ increasing in his beauty before us as we battle the world, the flesh, and the devil. Let the celebration continue. Let the light dawn. Let it shine brilliantly upon us this week as we go to our day of celebration. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 tells us that Christ came to save his people from their sins. If you have no Christ, then this week will be virtually meaningless, except for presence and maybe hanging out with some family. How sad. May by the Holy Spirit you turn away from a life of self-focus. Put your trust in Jesus Christ who died and rose from the grave and experience the wonder of hope, and joy, and grace. Pastor Joe, would you close us, sir? Our blessed Heavenly Father, we are indeed grateful that we have great hope because the baby laid in a manger would grow to be a broad-shouldered king on whom the government of the world could rest and rest easily. We thank you for joy 
because he is our king and because the zeal of the Lord of hosts will place him upon that throne because you, Father, have chosen to be gracious to us and give us such a king. And we, though unworthy, bask in the goodness of your grace and we join with the angelic song to the Father and to the Son, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty who was and who is and who is to come. Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And because of your will, they existed and were created. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Lord bless you as you go. Grab a cup of coffee. At about 11.15 we'll start tackling curious angels. So if you're curious about curious angels and you're not a cat, which might be killed by all the curiosity, you're welcome to join us. Thank you. You are dismissed.